This is Beyond a Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Gary Smith. Gary, it feels like forever since we've done uh, RD, huh? Far too long, in my opinion. Yes, I know. Welcome uh, welcome to the Sunday edition, uh, which we rarely miss. And uh, interesting today, um, and I sent it to you. I, I noticed that the Post picked it up. I had sent you, you as my paralegal and found it yesterday. Yes. Uh, a lot of people talk about the shadow docket, and that's where the Supreme Court will issue orders and they're per curiam orders, which means by the court and um, uh, things will get done there on a expedited basis. And uh, there's an argument uh, that there, that's where the, the big swings are actually taking place in the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. One of the things I found interesting that came out, what's the date on it, Gary? Do you have it there? Uh, I do. Let me uh, Let me pull it up just to make sure that I don't screw that up. But the date on it appears to be uh, uh, May 18th, 2023. Okay. So in a um, order connected to an order on uh, Title 42, uh, then we find which has now expired right. because of the the expiration of the COVID emergency three years later, three years and three months later, 30 months, uh, or 39, I think, total. Um, I, I'll do the math later. But for our purposes, in a uh, order that he wrote and stuck basically onto the Title 42 expiration, Gorsuch penned is it eight pages in what can only be described as a scathing rebuke of national, local, uh, municipal, as he calls it, uh, uh, COVID declarations of emergency, goes through and talks about it as, I think there's some great language in there. They closed Um, churches even as they allowed casinos and other favored businesses to carry on. They threatened violators, not just with civil penalties, but with criminal sanctions too. They surveilled church parking lots, recorded license plates, and issued notices warning that attendees, even at outdoor services, satisfying all social distancing and hygiene requirements could amount to criminal conduct. That's my favorite. It's wild. I I was just discussing this with... um, a client who's embroiled in all of this. And we were just uh, talking about, um, interestingly, as you may remember, Gary, we talked about it before. Gorsuch was the one lone kind of first dissenter on the court uh, during some of the cases uh, that were challenging COVID and specifically uh, as a, the limits as opposed to the churches. And he was also the one who came out and talked about this and was mocking the towering presence that courts have constructed around uh, Jacobson, I I believe is the case, which is that case from 1905 uh, out of Massachusetts. And he then was able, in a subsequent case, to get four people or convince four of the other justices to come along with him. So it'll be interesting to see if this is kind of a um, uh, uh, the the beginning of him waiting to take another case or the U.S. Supreme Court waiting to take another case to find damages in or to sustain that there's a cause of action against the municipalities for the assault on the, on the rights that came out of the COVID slash emergencies. Yeah, absolutely. And you had sent this to me and I was, uh, I was looking into it and looking at some of the, the hoopla that was going on on Twitter. And uh, it would very much seem that you are, uh, as I'm, I'm stealing your own quote here, you're vibing with the right at the moment. You know, you're, uh, you're enjoying this, this thing that is, uh, has really sort of, activated the the right hand side of twitter a little bit at least as of last night and into this morning yeah i don't know why that is i don't either 
You know, I used to I used to think of the left as the bastion of civil civil liberties and, and rights, and I it's it's too complicated to try and figure out ideologically which side you're supposed to be on. All I know is that there was uh, I used to say how how is it that we can here in California uh, uh, basically uh, suspend speedy trial rights. I mean, you know that 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 that's to me is unbelievable. I mean, the, I think about the uh, the Tate brothers who uh, Tina is representing, and the um, the that that Romania um, uh, has that provision where they can just basically have a preventative detention, and that's in essence when you suspend speedy trial rights in the United States. That is the same thing. You have no cash bail or you have cash bail and then you suspend speedy trial rights uh that's quite a uh, that's quite a thing to actually occur when when gorsuch talks about it in that paragraph you just read it, you start to you start to say to yourself did, did this really happen i mean it's, it's almost like you we've got a repressed memory about it yeah, it's it's very hard to believe. And, and for those who haven't maybe heard the episodes where we've been talking about the Tate brothers, you know, they have a situation in Romania where basically you can arrest somebody and detain them without charges for, I believe it's up to six months, which just seems hard to fathom. And then you start to look, hindsight being 2020, at some of the things that were done in our country in, ironically, 2020 and beyond, and, and some of the restrictions that were placed on certain businesses, while others were able to operate exactly as they had for time and memoriam and it's just it's it boggles the mind yeah the one the one that i just have so much um you know obviously we've talked about tin horn flats but right. the uh the other is the um the location in the valley where the the woman that was there op- closed down and right 25 feet away the uh the uh somebody's doing some filming and it was okay for them to be serving a caterer to be serving outdoors for the filming, but it was not okay for her to be, uh, uh, serving a patrons outdoors. It was just uh, unbelievable to me that you could just make those kinds of distinctions. Yeah. That, that one was absolutely abhorrent in my opinion. It was in the media reports on it were hilarious because it showed this woman standing in front of her bar that had been forced to close down. And then they didn't even have to physically move. They just panned the camera to the right. And there was three tents, you know, almost football side football field length that were supposed to be for all of the craft services for this Hollywood production. It was, it, it was hard to really understand. Yeah. Well, I, I think with, uh, uh, the tide, however, is, uh, is shifting and we're starting to realize just how insane that uh, some of these things were. I, the, 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 uh, when you have somebody issuing eight page orders, basically laying it out like Gorsuch did, I think that's a precursor for, uh, where the courts are headed here. I think in the in the long run, that's probably for the best. I mean, you know, sunlight being the best disinfectant, disinfectant rather. We, you know, we've got to sort of look back with with a little bit of you know institutional knowledge and sort of realize what happened here and and make sure that we avoid mistakes that that may happen again. I'm with you. I'm with you. So we've got a big week. Also, I mean, tomorrow uh, part of the other. Uh, chatter that's uh, been around in the legal world is uh brian kohlberger yeah. who is charged with the uh, murders of the four co-eds and uh in idaho that case has been uh they speaking of speedy trial one of the things that has been talked about in the last couple of days that i've noticed is that people have been talking about the fact that the lawyers had waived their speedy trial rights to the preliminary hearing right. and which was supposed to be i believe next month in uh, june and now the prosecution went to grand jury which is the other form of pro- probable cause proceeding what that does now is that 
that eliminates the ability of the defense to cross-examine the witnesses, number one. It eliminates, obviously, the ability of the media to cover every twist and turn of the preliminary hearing uh, and the witnesses as they testify, because the grand jury is done in uh, secret, basically. And a lot of people were asking, well, was that a mistake to have the waiver of time to uh, to prepare in a uh, potentially capital case um, uh, in order to give the prosecution more time so they could get their ducks in a row and do the grand jury and skirt having to have their witnesses uh, be cross-examined. My immediate reaction is, is that the lawyers are in a no-win situation because it would have been, um, if they had pressed for the preliminary hearing, uh, quickly, it, it hard pressed to be prepared in that case. And there was obviously a whole lot of things that were done. Remember, the he was not arrested until a substantial period of time had elapsed, and they were doing all kinds of investigations. So, all of those agencies that were investigating were had all uh, basically a head start on the defense until the uh, charges were brought would be my reaction. Also, I'm told no expert on Idaho state law, but I'm told that they do go to a grand jury uh, with some degree of frequency, unlike other jurisdictions, state court jurisdictions. You know, the feds will set a preliminary hearing, but almost in, inevitably always go by way of a grand jury indictment. And the the further wrinkle to that was that it made news a few weeks ago or, or possibly months, I can't remember, uh, that the defense was seeking to have one of the surviving uh, residents or at least tenants at the time of the incident of that house to testify and that they were fighting it. Is that correct? That's correct. In fact, I think what they worked out is a compromise that they would take a deposition, which you normally don't have in a criminal case absent extraordinary circumstances. Um, and uh, that was going to be the, uh, the, the compromise. And uh, obviously, if that's done, that does not have to be public either. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw, but Dateline recently did an episode on this case and uh, they revealed some some new information. They alluded to a source, which I believe would be in strong violation of the gag order that's been placed on this case. Um, and you know, I, I watched it. It was two hours. There was a lot we already knew. Um, almost, almost all of it was stuff we already knew. And then there were a few things that were, um, certainly new, some uh, relating to the source that I referenced and some relating to people wholly uninvolved in this case, you know, people who purport to be from earlier portions of this gentleman's life in different parts of the country where he lived. And there were some allegations in there that, um, you know, when I first saw them, they certainly seemed gross and icky. And then that's definitely, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't change that opinion that I held when I first saw them. But upon speaking to you, uh, you point out, you know, yeah, they're definitely gross if they're true, but they are incendiary and a, a real problem if they're not true. Yeah, that's a, and this happens in these high profile, what I always call supersized cases where there, there's a great focus on them that you will hear rumor after rumor, according to a source, always in violation of the gag order uh, surrounding the case. And, and then um, oftentimes it'll turn out to be absolutely untrue. And I think that does real damage to um, somebody's ability to get a fair trial, obviously. I, yeah, I don't think that's in dispute because, you know, from the moment that I saw those those new allegations um, that anyone can find by going and checking it out, uh, it has to do with a, a former relationship that he had with a female. Um, they're stuck in my head now, you know, and, and I watching the Dateline thing and, and seeing with your comments in mind, it, it helped me to, to detach a little, but that's still in there. And if I'm a prospective juror, um, that's going to be really hard to divorce myself from because it, it's just it's in there. That's the way it goes. I mean, you, you, the mind or the brain works in a, a very uh, organized way where if you have that information, you end up uh, uh, processing it. It's very hard to consciously set it aside. Yeah, I completely agree. You can do your best to, to divorce yourself from that, that particular filter, but 
even in trying to do that, it's you're thinking about that particular filter, and that's that's really going to screw you up, I think. So it'll be interesting to see tomorrow is his arraignment, yeah. and I think uh, the whether they waive time again um, will be interesting. Uh, I suspect that you may see the defense uh, waive their speedy trial rights for the reasons of preparation, as I had mentioned before. And I don't know whether it's also it would be interesting to know whether they expected this to go by way of a grand jury or whether they were caught by surprise. They may, we may get some indication at the arraignment. Well, follow here and uh, stick close to reasonable doubt. We'll be covering the uh, Kober- the Koberger uh, indictment and all of the information surrounding that. And to harken back to the beginning of the episode, we also are going to be joined by an expert on the so-called shadow docket to talk a little bit more about that topic as well. So we have plenty to cover and uh, stay tuned to just general media. I think you might see Mark make a few appearances over the course of the week. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll be everywhere. Got it. Thanks, Gary. Have a great Sunday. Thanks, Mark. You as well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash reasonable doubt podcast.